The meeting starting now. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, paper session 10. Uh, paper session 10, uh, which is uh, titled application. So as you can expect, we have a nice assortment an eclectic assortment of papers that look to take VR and AR technology and 3D user interfaces uh, beyond the lab and, and uh, to the actual benefit of, of uh, users. Um, so we have uh, five exciting talks, uh, five papers. Um, you, by now, you probably know the rules. Uh, there will be an opportunity after each paper to ask a few short questions. Um, they will be uh, pasted into the uh, Zoom chat and I will be reading them out uh, for the speakers. And also there will be the opportunity to talk to the uh, authors of the speakers in Gather Town after the session. So um, we're uh, track B, so uh, you will have to make your way to Gather Town Q&A track B. So um, with that being said, let's uh, go ahead and start with our first paper titled Design and Evaluation of Personalized Percutaneous Coronary Interve Intervention Surgery Simulation System. And the speaker is Jiahao uh, Tsui. Uh, Jiahao is a PhD student um, at the State Key Laboratory of Virtual Reality Technology and Systems. And that is at Beihang University in Beijing, uh, China. So, um, Jia Hao, please go ahead and present your paper. Okay, thank, uh, thank you for your introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jia Hao, and I'm from Beihang University. And this is a sorry. Um, this is a joint work between Beihang University and Peking Union Medical College Hospital. According to statistics, cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of mortality worldwide. PCI is the main treatment for CVDs. The main operation procedure of PCI is to cannulate the heart and the X-ray imaging. Due to the complex stru structure of the heart and vessels, cardiologists need to carefully manipulate instruments. Unconfident or incorrect operations will result in more radiation dosage more angiography times and intraoperative complications, which are hazardous for both patients and cardiologists. Therefore, there is a significant requirement for effective PCI training and rehearsal platforms. Traditional training approaches for PCI rely on clinical patients or corpses, which could cause negative effects. Although desktop simulators have been used broadly in recent years, most of them can only provide certain immersive environments with a few pre-processed organ models, which brings differences between training experiences and actual surgery situations. In healthcare, researchers have employed VR for both simulations of surgeries, operating rooms, and stress inoculation training. Since some basic operation skills such as cutting and suturing can be obtained and transferred to the operating room without having fully realistic, realistic simulations. The additional value of VR in basic training is not significant over traditional trainers. Pilot clinical studies have revealed the validity of immersive VR in training surgeons to achieve profit, proficiency and self-management against distractions. However, the implementation and validation of immersive VR surgical simulators for advanced operation skills or surgery rehearsal rarely have been investigated. Existing VR-based PCI system are used VR controllers to manipulate virtual instruments while not responding to real tools. According to user studies, although the immersive setup obtain higher usability score than the no immersive sit setup, Participants recommend that the system should include a haptic device to increase the realism of the simulation and interaction. Using VR controllers for training also leads to negative transfer effects. In summary, challenges in VR PCI training are from three aspects. Respond to personalized data, interaction using real instruments, and validation. 
Uh, we focus on the component tests of PCI training and rehearsal with fully realistic simulations. Our sim system can di directly take patient-specific data as input and generate virtual 3D intervention scenarios. Uh, we develop tracking and feed had feedback hardware for real PCI instruments. Um, the key components of our system is a fiber-based cardiac dynamic model and tracking the and tracking feedback module. Uh, the dy dynamic model can be established based on CT data and driven by ECG and US data. Um, in the interest of presentation time and considering the topics of our session, I will focus more on our evaluations and findings. For the details of the fiber-based model, we can have more discussion in the Gather Town. Uh, The key component, uh, sorry. We design and develop a tracking and haptic feedback hardware. And the hardware includes a movable module running on slide rails. The module consists of a camera and two pair of rollers. Linkage mechanisms are designed to drive the rollers to change the shape of, uh, of a pipe to simulate vessels. Uh, the module is controlled and served by a single chip microcomputer. When users manipulate a guideware in the pipe, the camera can obtain the movement of the guideware in real time by capturing videos. The type of the instruments together with their motion parameters, such as uh, positions, velocities, and acceleration, are computed by the SCM and then transmitted to our simulation software. The virtual instruments are then modeled based on those parameters. Simulation results are transmitted back to the SEM to keep the movable module tracking real instruments and providing feedback. Um, for evaluations, we first evaluate the accuracy and efficiency of our system in cardiac modeling. Then we conduct two user studies. Um, for the accuracy evaluation, we use a 4D mesh sequence of the heart as ground truth. The meshes are reconstructed from 4D MRI, MRI sequences corresponding to a complete cardiac cycle. The image sequence has 25 frames and they provide the ground truth of heart deformation at each frame of the heart cardiac cycle. Our method achieves higher accuracy compared with other methods. We develop eight rehearsal tasks with personalized clinical data and compute the average time cost for each human involved modeling step. Statistics indicate that our simulation system take less than an hour to convert a clinical case to virtual rehearsal task and accomplish the rehearsal. Uh, in the first uh, study, we compare our uh, system with a desktop simulator. Consider the high risk and ethical issues in validating and comparing training effects on patients. We employ a within subject design and examine the two training platforms in terms of user experience. We expect to explore the strengths and deficiencies of the immersive VR PCI simulators. The study can be considered exploratory and the findings can be used as guidelines for the subsequent modifications of our system and provide insights on further research topics related to the validation and application of immersive VR simulators. Um, 20 trainees participate in the first study. Uh, they are medical students and have no clinical PCI experiences. Uh, our system is compared with VSG5, a commercial intervention simulator. Uh, VSG5 is by far the most validated in the industry. With the help of two cardiologists, we select two training tasks with similar difficulty, neither too easy nor too hard to avoid a selling effect. We first introduce each platform for the participants and inform them that the purpose of the study. Then all the participants perform two training tasks with the desktop simulator and our system respectively. The order of training platform is counterbalanced. After completing each training task, uh, participants are requested to answer three questionnaires regarding their experience and present presents. Uh, the comparison results reflects the strengths of VR simulators in ease of use uh, portrayed by other researchers. The simulation of environments such as virtual patients' equipment and can enhance the particip participants' sense of familiarity and presence as they commented. 
participants rate frustration as high and effort as low indicates that they tend to feel the stress created by immersive environments. Um, previous, previous work uh, pointed out that the perception of risk is a four of uh, physiological stressors and reported that virtual immersive environments would evoke physiological resp uh, responses similar to those evoked by co the corresponding real environments. Um, however, further investigation is needed to explore how much the insecure and stressed feeling is caused by fully realistic simulations or using VR techniques. Uh, in both hands, as well as both shoulders, some participants experience insupportable discomfort. Our system gets better scores than VCG5 in both hands, which are the most important body regions for intervention manip manipulation. Uh, our results also show discomfort in the eyes and head. This is supported by previous works, which also reveals the weakness of VR simulators. This finding recommends that training tasks should be limited in duration. Uh, the presence questionnaire results show that our surgery simulation system is perceived as adequate immersive, and uh, it demonstrates the uh, accuracy of the both tracking algorithm and haptic feedback module, as well as the usefulness of their integration. Uh, in the second study, the expert validity of our system in PCI surgery training and rehearsal is assessed by experienced cardiologists. Uh, they first perform rehearsal tasks individually. Uh, statistics on personalized uh, modeling efficiency, heart information precision, and the rehearsal time, along with user experiences measured in the first user study, are provided to them before an uh, interview. Uh, the interview consists of the following questions. Uh, with regard to functions that are needed, a majority of uh, cardiologists report that dynamic cardiac simulation is the basis. Uh, they commend that traditional training platforms such as corpses and artificial human models fail to provide dynamic vessels or heart, and the simulators are supposed to complete this drawback. Most of them report that basic PCI skills can be acquired from corpses or models. For some advanced skills, um, they can only be acquired from simulators and real patients. Uh, all the cardiologists consider that a rehearsal system, uh, the, for the rehearsal system, the ability in dealing with personalized data is another basis. Uh, most of them think no system can complete, uh, completely reproduce PCI scenarios. Um, and they think errors are acceptable in rehearsal platforms. Uh, they said that they focused more on the organ shapes, but they could not suggest a specific simulation accuracy that is meaningful to PCI rehearsal. Mm. They also think uh, the system needs to process clinical data in no more than 24 hours before a planned PCI. Uh, they affirm the authenticity of the heart deformation, uh, virtual instrument behaviors, and their spatial temporary consistency. Uh, some of them opinions, uh, some of their opinions uh, enlighten the future development of our system. For example, uh, several cardiologists report that our haptic feedback is accuracy enough for PCI training, while they are very sensitive to the resistance of real vessels as a result of experience accumulation. Uh, considering high resolution haptic devices could be difficult and expensive to develop and deploy, we should focus more on VR workarounds that may enhance realism. Uh, finally, uh, there are op op opinions uh, that, that our system should be included in the training of novices PCI surgeons and the system is suitable for PCI rehearsal. Extension iterations are recommended by cardiologists to establish the construct validity and uh, criteria validity of our system. Uh, as the trainees in our evaluation experiments uh, did not go through a, a real PCI on patients, we cannot firmly conclude about the effect of training transfer of our system. However, we believe that our user studies and results are still meaningful and indicative because our experiments were conducted based on clinical cases and the feedbacks are acquired from experienced cardiologists. Uh, the development, validation, and application of medical simulators are acknowledged problems in CG and VR communities. This research is our first step in a long journey. 
the research still has several limitations, which suggest, suggest topics for our future work. Subsequent validation studies using other measures should be our immediate directions. For example, discriminative validation. It would also be interesting to explore the use of our system for PCI navigation. Thank you for watching and thank you for questions. Thank you, Jia Hao. So, um, uh, excellent work. Um, I will be monitoring a, um, the chat to see if there are any questions from the audience. But in the meantime, I'll go ahead and ask you, um, do you think that, so, so you're, you're handling a very, very important problem, medical problem, and very frequent medical problem. So coming up with a, with a good simulator and a good way to train that is safe is obviously very, very important. However, um, you seem to have um, uh, invested quite a, bit of, quite a bit of thought on how to design these haptic feedback devices for, for this particular case. And I was wondering about generality. Do you think that you learned something that would help you make a, a haptic feedback, a simulator for another procedure more easily from what, what you have done for, for this work? So um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I have uh, prepared uh some other slides about uh, our uh, haptic feedback hardware. And okay. uh, mo uh, the most important thing is that uh, how, we, uh, how we can uh, get the ground truth uh, force from the uh, human bodies. Uh, in this work, we use an in vivo two dwarf mechanism to measure the pushing and uh, uh, retracting resistance force. And from a human body, and we uh, use a mo mo motor to uh, to change the uh, shape of pipe to simulate the the vessel, and and I think that um, uh, just for this kind of uh, intervention surgery, uh, uh, our uh, haptic feedback module is uh, worked well, and uh, I think for other uh, Surgeries such as uh, some uh, some some surgery need to cut and suture, su suturing uh, the organs. Uh, we may need some uh, uh, advanced uh, haptic feedback device such as phantoms, and uh, oh. that that could work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So. Um... Uh, thanks for your answer. I have a question now, and I think it was my fault. I didn't look at the right tab here, but I have a question from, from, the, from the audience. So Bruce Daniel is asking, did the experts think that this approach could replace the VIST G5 system among their trainees now or in the future? So do you think that your, your, your system can replace a VIST a G5? Also, what would you see as the ultimate cost versus the VIST simulator. So what is, what is the, 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 the trade-offs? What are the trade-offs between the two? The, are you ready to draw some final conclusions between these two systems? Okay, and for the uh, first questions, and uh, cardiologists uh, did not, uh, uh, did not uh, say that uh, our system can fully replace the with G5 or some desktop simulator because that uh, the, uh, the, the, the desktop simulators are uh, more easy to employ and deploy uh, in the uh, hospitals or medical colleges. Um, the VR simulator needs um, more hardware, de uh, hardware or devices such as the uh, HMD and uh, the, and, and maybe they are more uh, custom to use uh, the desktop simulator. So uh, they, don't, uh, they don't think that uh, our, our system can fully replace uh, with G5 and other desktop simulators. Uh, so uh, could you, uh, could you uh, I, have, uh, I have not uh, here, here the, so what is the second question? Yes. So for the second question, what is uh, and you already answered it. Uh, it was asking what is a weaker point of your system compared to the VIST five G five system, and you answered that already. So 
Uh, thank you so, so much. Again, remember, extend, um, additional time with the authors can be had in Gather Town. So thank you so much for your talk, Jaho. Okay, okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So we're moving on to the, uh, to the second uh, presentation, uh, the second paper, and uh, the second paper switching windows here. The second paper is titled Augmented Reality for Subsurface Utility Engineering Revisited. And the speaker is Hansen uh, Lesche Heregard. Uh, Lesche is a, a PhD student at Albert University and his research interests include uh, BIM and GIS data, as well as uh, development of new technologies in AR. So um, without further delay, um, Please go ahead, uh, Lasse, and, and uh, tell us about your work. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me clear? Yes, perfect. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, and this is the office of this paper. Uh, and here's, yeah, here's a picture of me and the rest of the office who has collaborated on this paper. Um, so let me start out by talking about the visualization or talking about the motivation behind this paper. So subsurface utility excavation damage is a real costly problem, as can be seen by the yearly estimated numbers from the UK and the US. And we, of course, want to try to help this problem by using AR to assist in subsurface utility engineering, or for short, SUE. And SUE is really this is the name of the work practice of, the, of what the utility workers uh, refer to when they're trying to locate and uh, the underground utilities to safely avoid them when digging. So AR for SUE is a known use case, but we wanted to re revisit this AI use case by taking a new approach on how to visualize subsurface utility data by putting forward two new visualization methods and uh, methods that aim to be more relatable for the SUE workers. And secondly, we also put forward solutions for wide area localization in AR by using a low cost uh, sensor box. So just to start out with some background, let's briefly talk about how AR for underground infrastructure are approached by current commercial solution. For the visualization part, current com uh, solutions tend to always show utility as a data as 3D models. And this might uh, seem obvious, but it also imposes some challenges. So for instance, if only visualized as a naive visualization, the 3D model seems like they're floating above the ground, as clearly seen in the video. And even though the visualization in the video is using a shadow projection to indicate that the 3D model is placed below the ground, the augmented shadow projection itself also suffers from the uh, perspective offsets, offsets as it relies on a planar ground surface estimation. So really, actually, when one look at it, the commercial solution are just using the same techniques that has been demonstrated um, from researchers for over 10 years ago. And then for the outdoor localization problem, the commercial so solutions tends to use survey antennas as hardware and on. And this is not a bad idea, but often the hardware is very expensive or is closed system. So for instance, the triple side vision, uh, which only works as an all-in-one Android solution or be very bulky, as for instance, seen on the VGS uh, image on the right. And for sure, these external DNS antennas can achieve a high accuracy, but it's when they become too bulky, it also uh, uh, sacrifices the free movement uh, for an AI system that is commonly risk for. All right, so let me talk about the first visualization method that presented in the paper, which we call the virtual utility market. We recognize that the utility information handed over to the contractors is in most cases only PDF drawings or at best 2D vector data as shown on the images. And another fact was that the utility data often don't have depth information attached to it. So which actually then makes it pointless to convert the utility data into 3D models as often uh, AI solutions presented before tend to do. And this was actually then considered in our uh, development of the visualization method as we aim to make a method that also works fine with just 2D vector lines as data source. We then added a further challenge to the development of our visualization, visualization method. And that was to raise the question, was it possible to make something that was very relatable and plausible looking for the utility workers in the field? 
And for that, we took, tried to take uh, direct inspiration for how real utility markings look like, as seen on the, the images on the right. So to achieve this um, same visual appearance, really, we divided into three elements we wanted our method to replicate. First, we wanted the virtual markings to follow the ground surface very close, closely. So to start off, we use 16 by 16 pixel sprites of the spray point dot and then closely place them along the trajectory of the utility data as it then presented a spray marking line. And after that, we made use of ray casters to closely align the placement and attention of the spray dots onto the generated, onto a generated 3D mesh reconstruction of the ground surface. For the second element was to have the markings blending with the ground surface as real spray paint does. And really for that, we use texture, we use texture blending effects as commonly used in photo editor software or in screen effects uh, as used in 3D game engines. And the shader blending formula uh, is shown on the right and is also more commonly known as the overlay blend mode effect. And then the third and last element was to have the virtual markings follow the styles and symbols and colors used in utility marking guidelines as can be seen on the right figure. So next up, uh, I want to describe how we come up with the second visual safety method presented in this paper, what we call virtual utility daylighting. And the daylighting might seem a bit odd, but the naming daylighting is a reference to the SUE work practice of carefully digging down to utilities until they're exposed to daylight, thereby the naming. And um, it's totally opposite to the first method uh, because this method relies on 3D model as input data, but not just regular 3D primitive shapes like tubes, uh, but in this case, uh, 3D as-built reconstructions of utility excavation holes. And these uh, 3D as-builds is actually a new trend starting to be used by utility owners to 3D document their utility excavation work, as can be seen here in the picture. And as you can see here, the, the utility workers we work with have been quite active in using this 3D capturing technique. So the challenge uh, with this visualization uh, method was that we worked with a 3D reconstruction data set uh, that was provided as uh, dense point clouds. So the first challenge was to handle the point clouds in a performant way. And for this, we used a nested oak tree uh, structure based on the Po tree and, and implemented in Unity, which was our rendering engine for the AR, AR developments. And the second challenge we wanted to solve when, when visualizing the 3D point clouds in AR was to have the back face of the point clouds to be occluded. As we were dealing with point clouds, we could not just use uh, back face cooling uh, for, this, for this simple problem, as would be the case if we were dealing with the uh, Texas 3D mesh reconstructions where we had the, the normal values of the, of the surface. Uh, therefore, we used a plane swinging algorithm that estimated the curvature of the top side of the excavation hole for them to create a plane surface uh, used uh, for occlusion. Okay, and for the AR system in this paper, we used an iPad Pro fourth generation with the LiDAR sensor on the rear. And really the LiDAR sensor and the AR kit function was directly used in our uh, visualization method by taking advantage of the real-time 3D mesh uh, generation provided by the LiDAR. And the second was that a small and compact, compact uh, sensor box using low-cost components um, uh, was also added on. And this uh, sensor cube has since uh, the submission of the paper been developed further by the AR4 team. And the version on the right picture here is the latest uh, version you can see, and it's now called Caps Lock. And the sensor cube has a lot of components in it, but the major components we used uh, was the differential GNS component. And it was used to achieve, uh, right, uh, to achieve the right area uh, localization uh, for our AI system. And on the image to the right, you can also see that here is a helix antenna with a dual frequency, which we, uh, which we attach to it. And we have found out that these, this uh, antenna is the preferable type of uh, antennas to use. And this can actually be backed up by the result from the accuracy evaluation performed in the paper. Uh, well, you can see the results here on the slides. And the evaluation showed that an important aspect was to keep a fixed RTK connection to achieve the highest accuracy. 
And uh, really here, the, we have found out that the helix design of the antenna helps to maintain a more robust connection as, it's, as it's, it is designed for six degrees of freedom movement. And moving forward, we will, uh, we will continue to use the, the helix-based antennas. Okay, now let's have a look at the virtual utility markings in action. So on the left, you can see a representation of the utility data used as input. And on the right is the data visualized as uh, virtual marking, markings. And you can see that they're closely resembling real utility markings. We will now look into some example of how the visualization method works in relation to the three elements I presented earlier. So first off is a demonstration of the on-surface placement. We can see here that the real-time reconstruction mesh generated from the LiDAR sensor for LiPad Pro. And, you can see, and we can see that the virtual marking is closely following the mesh and thereby closely following the street surface. And this is clearly useful. Uh, for, example, for instance, when, uh, when ground surface has a significant change in elevation levels, which is uh, often the case in constructed environments as can be seen here in the video. And another case where this is really useful is doing uh, excavation, as can be seen in, uh, in this video example, where you can also see that the virtual markings closely follow the, the surface of the excavation hole. The second element we looked at was to achieve realistic looking blending with virtual markings and, uh, and the real ground surface. And in the video here, you can see a close up example for that. And it's clear to see how the texture from the pavement, pavement blends naturally with the overlaid virtual markings. And another example is when dealing with shadows. Here you can see an example of the virtual markings blending nicely with a surface covered in sunlight and a surface covered in shadows. However, our visualization approach was also found to work not that well on light surfaces, as can be seen here, for instance, for instance on the, on the white uh, road markings, where you would have expected that the virtual markings uh, to look uh, a lot more greener. And then the last element we looked at was for our visualization approach to follow the same style, symbols, and colors of common utility marking guidelines. For example, on the left picture, you can see the virtual marking shown as an H symbol pattern that is used to indicate the width of the utility asset. And on the right, you can see the example of the red colors and aberrations are used. Okay, and then for the last, the virtual utility daylighting in action. And uh, on the video, the visualization method can be seen in action. It's clear to see that the realistic looking point clouds creates the impression of looking into a real excavation. And, or um, yeah, a virtual version of a utility day daylighting, as it's called in SUE. The dense point clouds is also rendered in a performant way, as can be seen in the video recording, making it really a believable experience. And what really adds to that fact is because of the close alignment between the visual features on the virtual model and the real street surface, as highlighted on the pictures. And for my last slides, you can see here the occlusion plane created by sweeping algorithm. Uh, and um, yeah, without we can clearly see, see that without the occlusion plane, it is clear to see that the underground parts of the situated point cloud model is subject to the perspective offset. Yes, um, yeah, thank you for listening to the presentation. Hope you enjoyed it, enjoyed it and uh, I will gladly welcome any questions. Thank you, Lasse. Uh, thank you for a great talk and for great work. And like I was telling you earlier on, um, when I presented the, the session, uh, you, you, you would see a wide range of applications and indeed uh, the, the difference couldn't be greater from, from, the, from the first paper to the second one. Um, uh, great visuals, uh, very stable annotations, uh, very, very nice work. Um, so uh, as I'm waiting for the, for the Q&A to populate for, for this new, this new paper for paper number two, I'm going to ask you a question, uh, Lasse. So, um, you you have seen your users actually carry carry the tablets and and inspect the pavement or inspect the real world uh, with that uh, with that tablet. And of course, 
there is a little bit of a, of a dual view issue. In other words, what they see on the tablet doesn't uh, match what they would see uh, if uh, the tablet were actually transparent or were not there. So in other words, if you see a line on the tablet, that uh, line um, still has to be found on in the real world um, on the actual pavement by sort of translating the image that you have on the tablet to to the actual pavement so i was wondering if you if you thought that, that was a problem if you had any thoughts on on how you might address that so just to be clear so the problem of the the use of finding the right place to look at really to, to be able to indicate on the ground uh so so once you take the tablet away to to draw let's say with chalk on the ground the, the line that they they saw to localize it yeah. in the in the real world yeah well um yeah well we have talked about that and i guess that is also one of the first reasons really to go with the tablet instead of a headset because really in, instead of going with a headset for instance a hololens the first thing that the first felt that it was really too awkward to be in the outdoors with that mm -hmm. and the tablets really provide the best possibility to have this collaborative sense where you, you can easily gather three people around doing the same picture but um, yeah of course you know a nice extension to that could be maybe to have you know this mounted on a you know an actually spray paint um, a machine right you have this small um, you know uh, yeah, I don't know what to call it, but uh, a stick on a wheel. So that, that could maybe be, be something. So yeah. you could more directly also add the real spray painting based on the virtual spray paintings. Uh, yeah, just, yes. just we haven't uh, tried to develop anything yet, but something surely we have to thought about. Yeah. Sure, thank you. Thank you for your answer. So uh, I have uh, two questions from the from the audience, um, and uh, Bruce Daniel has a question, but also uh, Sang Lee. So since I read Bruce's question the first time, I'm going to read uh, Sang Lee's question. So you you might have talked about it, but I wonder if the tablet supports any interactivity beyond viewing. In general, I would love to learn any insights on what the target users would like on the augmented view what they would like to do on the multi-touch screen instead of just simply viewing. So that, that is a question. Yeah, uh, no, it's for now, no, it's not presenting any more information, but because we really just try to, you know, take all the valuable attributes data that, that there are in GLS data. So for instance, it could be that the width, the type of material of a pipe and stuff like that. And then, is, so for example, in the in in having the if you have the width data available, we try to visualize this as a as a as this H pattern. And um, but but yeah, that that was it. Uh, we haven't uh, tried to to have any other inter interactions implemented. But you could of course uh, imagine that if you're just tapping on the virtual markings, you could have you know all if. <laughs> depending on, on, on what attribute values you really had, because that's really the real challenge, is that I think a lot of these current commercial approaches, they just expect that we have, you know, very high quality utility data, but that's not the case, you know, often we just based on PDF drawings that then has to be converted into something digital, like uh, a, a 2D vector line. And so it was really trying to start from the bottom. Got it. Well, I'll squeeze in one more very quick question, and I want you to give me a 10 second answer because we're out of time. So does alignment or virtual daylighting excavation rely purely on data from the helix antenna or can the users adjust, refine the position and the alignment? So can you fine tune the registration manually? 10 uh, seconds. Yeah, no, it doesn't purely uh, relies on the sensor cube. You can do it manually. And thank you. So for addition, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. So for for additional discussions, please join the. Uh, please, thank you. Uh, please join uh, Lasse and the other speakers in in Gather Town. So thank you very much. Um, we're moving on, uh, we're moving on to um, to paper number three. I'm looking at so so please mute yourselves those who are not speakers. Um, so paper number three is titled a compelling virtual tour of the Dan Huang cave with an immersive head-mounted display. And the speaker is Chen Yangsheng, 
who is currently a director. He has uh, he wears multiple hats, like like many of us do. Uh, he's a, a director with Aspire Incorporated. Uh, he's a lecturer uh, with the Department of Art History at Tainan National University of the Arts um, in Taiwan, and he's also working towards his PhD degree. Um, at the Graduate Institute of Networking and Multimedia uh, at the National Taiwan University. So um, we're, we're excited uh, to hear your talk. Uh, Yang Sheng, please go ahead. Hi, uh, can, can you hear my voice? Yes, I, yes I can. Well, thanks for introducing. And uh, also thanks CGNA and ISMA I invite our paper. So uh, let me, uh, to, to keep the best experience of the talking, please let me use the video to present our, uh, our paper. Hi, my name is Ping Chun Han. Today I want to present our research, a compelling virtual tour of the Dongwang Cave with an immersive Hemon display. To further learn the culture behind the Asian artifact displayed in the museum, visitors can utilize the audio guidance information board in kiosks. However, it is hard to have a deep appreciation for the culture heritage in an immersive experience with the art print. So it would be nice that the visitor could be on site, but once the entrance has been opened, the mural in the cave will gradually fade. So this is the motivation we want to build a VR version. We utilize the digital data of Dongwang Cave 61 and cover with Dongwang Research Academic and reproduce the virtual environment. And we propose the interaction technique that allow users to flexible experience the artifact. And we're trying to evaluate our system and to understand what the user could learn in the virtual reality. Most of the museum had done with the documentation and representation. When talking about the destination, previous research has done lots of great work on different platforms like desktop, cave system, AVE, and Tabletop system, and our work in trying to build a VR system. In our work, our design process could be mainly divided into four steps. First, we interview the historian to investigate the content of the cultural relies and highlight the interesting point, and we build the first prototype. Second, we represent the Dongwon K61 with a high resolution texture. Third, we propose the interaction technique for use in accepting the cave. Finally, we conduct a user study to investigate how users familiar themselves with a special context and assess argument information. First, inside into the Dongwon Cave, Cave 61 contains both tangible and intangible heritage. Story of Muro Tourists are not familiar with the Buddhist story in the Asian culture. Explanation and navigation are required during the visit. Unreachable Muro. Muro are pinned throughout the cave, even on the roof. Therefore, it is difficult for visitors to obtain a close-up view of the Muro in higher location. Obstacle Muro. It is impossible for visitors to view the entire Muro in one glance because of the pillar obscure part of it. Damage Muro. The passage of time has caused the color to fade, and some segments of the world have flecked off. Lost Status The 13 statues that were located in the center of the Dongwon Cave 61 were stolen or damaged a thousand years ago. Our previous war is a tabletop system. We utilize the material to build a VR hem on display. However, we discover several things. Animation. In the past, we only have a flat screen in front of the user, so it will be no difference when video occludes the mural. Exploration. 
Systems should provide a function for allowing the user to move around. In the feature of the restoration, could help the user to understand the change of the appearance by the time. Status in Mural Our status has lots of sub objects because the various archaeological result in our previous system. The resolution is fair enough in our previous system, but it is not good enough for the VR. So this is our system overview. The Dome One Academy already done with the special information in the raw data image, and we're trying to represent them with two kind of quality. The high quality is for the expert and tourists in the museum, and the low quality is for the user on the VR platform. In this installation, we present the system for virtual tours of Dunhuan Cave with immersive HMD, with which users explore the virtual Dunhuan Cave with the teleportation technique and appreciate the spatial characteristics of the entire space of the cultural heritage. Based on discussion with experts, we develop four interaction techniques for use in exhibiting Dunhuang Cave. Augmented information to disseminate the special heritage. In our system, the story is directly narrated in the virtual space. We use 3D motion graphics to provide augmented information floating on the related mural in VR. Teleport technique. We propose a 3D selection approach for the teleport technique. It allows users to explore the cave by easily selecting the spot they are interested in, such as the ground, the murals on the surrounding walls, or even the murals on the ceiling far above. 2D restoration. In our system, we use a virtual restoration flashlight with the ability to restore statues and murals when the corresponding hotspot is selected. There are two versions of restored murals corresponding to the mural's status in different centuries. 3D restoration. In the lost statues hotspot, the user waves the flashlight to reveal the virtual statues. So those are the overview of our interaction design. Finally, we conduct a user study. We recruit 20 participants in our experiment. After the VR experience, we give them a questionnaire to understand the system utility and the immersion. During the experience, we record the head transform information. Finally, a workshop is for evaluating what the participant had learned in the virtual cave. So that is the result of questionnaire. The system usability and immersion is fair enough for the user to participate in our user study. Region of interest. By the design of the hotspot, we are able to direct the user attention. However, user can still look around. So that is a critical issue when using the VR for virtual tool. What should result for special content? Most of the participants could give a correct answer in the question of highlighted content. And the participant can answer correct for the question about the surrounding area. The answer for special content are seldom forgot because the special content are constantly present. When we further investigate the participant when they occurring the information from special contexts, some structures are unclear at a far or short distance. The second is the context on the floor were easily missed. The grotto altered layer has meaning, but some user did not notice the grotto altar. Therefore, the system should recommend viewing precision in the virtual environment for the important features. Worksheet results for augmented information. Most of the participants can answer correct if the questions are covered by the audio guidance. If the question is not covered by the audio guidance, it could be easily forgot. But the participant actually remembers saying something. So a few user answer and see for the question about document information. Audio guidance in the virtual tool is very helpful. Most participants learn from the audio guidance. 
Audio hint can inform the user of facts which are easily missed or misrecognized. However, the audio guidance did not always help. For example, the mirror is too large to be appreciated or a clue by the author. So sometimes the participant cannot always follow the sound. Therefore, both auditory and visual feedback should be presented complementary. Besides the user study, we gather some user feedback from Don Juan Research Academic. The assistant helping them to reduce assess the real cave and inspect the cave in their laboratory. Second, we actually installed the VR system into the museum. Torres feel the experience for each person to be too short and would have liked to stay longer in the virtual cave to see more detail. So we upload our VR system to the VR platform. The system great impressed the senior VR player and even stunned the player who are not interested in Chinese art or cultural heritage. So if you are interested with our VR expert, you can download on Steam VR platform and you can see lots of good comments of it. And you can also download it on Viport. Besides the good common, our system file is very big and requires a good VR-ready computer. Conclusion We present a system for the virtual tour of the Dohong Cave with immersive human display. Intangible relies are augmented on the walls throughout the virtual cave. The participants like the feature of the mural restoration and state restoration. Our user studies show what the participants learn from the special context and the augment information. This could be a use for um, design consideration for developing other domain key or special heritage. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Sheng. Um, so we have some time for questions. Um, I see that a question has already appeared in the in the Q and A in Zoom. So I'm going to read it to you. So Mang Li is asking, why did you decide to use teleportation instead of other positions? For example, like the ballroom in the movie Ready Player One. Oh, uh, this is a good question. Actually, we have uh, researched uh, many types of. Uh, a moving function for users in the case. And finally, to develop our uh, application to the uh, thing, to, to the end user, the teleport is more safety uh, method to the user. And uh, in, in the actual exhibitions in Taiwan or in some, some short-term uh, short of exhibition, we use uh, the other a moving method called jump and glide. Uh, it lets users to jump and uh, gliding in the cave. That is very fun, but we cannot uh, control the safety issues uh, if users play in their home. So finally, we use the teleporting, but uh, apply the normal teleporting technology in the Donghuang Cave is more complicated, just like our paper says, because we want to let the user to see the floor. So we, we need to design some method for that. Uh, and also uh, the ballroom is also a good, a good method for it, but uh, we, we finally designed uh, the teleport to our, uh, to our major application methods. Thank you. So it looks like we have two more minutes if my way of computing time in multiples of 18 minutes is correct, and it should be three times 18 is 54. So <clears throat> there, there is no other question in the chat. So I've, um, I will ask you a question. You mentioned that um, it, it requires the, the, the virtual environment is, is complex or, or costly in a way or another, and it requires uh, powerful uh, virtual rendering uh, hardware. Uh, could you comment on how you know, how many triangles or how detailed, of what, how, how, how big is this virtual environment and why is it not readily acceptable to, to, to smaller or thinner VR clients? Okay, uh, in our case, uh, the, the, the hardest part is the 
resolution of the, of the textures because many of the uh, visitors go to the actual Dunhuang cave want to see the high uh, see the physical resolution of the of the cave but uh, to digitalize them we use the high resolution textures into our application so the actual uh, triangles or, or mesh part of uh, our cave is very low but we need to load in high many many uh, many textures uh, about uh, hundreds hundreds of, of hundreds of them so each texture has uh, exceeds about two 2k resolution of length so uh, loading this texture into the equation is, uh, is the hardest part to develop, to, to develop it. But uh, in another application, uh, if you want to create some uh, like a city city uh, city touring or like that, you may not face some uh, some massive mesh on it. But this is a different kind of strategy to to solve your Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It sounds like if you're willing to. <laughs> Put up with low resolution, you could you could downsample the textures, and since the geometry is not that complex, so yeah, that, that's good to know. Uh, quick question, five seconds answer: uh, Can the users can uh, sorry the 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 eSmart participants experience your demo? Can is that available online? Can it be downloaded? Are those details in the paper? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's move on. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Sheng. So uh, we're moving on with our sampling of the wide spectrum of VR and AR applications. And uh, we are at paper number four. The title is The Passenger Experience of Mixed Reality Virtual Display Layouts in Airplane Environments. And the, the speaker is uh, Medeiros Daniel, uh, who is a research associate uh, currently funded by the ERC uh, Viajero project in the School of Computing Science at the University of Glasgow. Uh, his interests, as uh, is probably the case for most of our speakers, are in uh, AR and VR, but in his case, in particular for passenger experiences. So, uh, Daniel, please uh, take over and tell us about your work. So, uh, thanks for the introduction. So, I'm Daniel Medeiros uh, from the University of Glasgow, and I'm here to present the paper, The Passenger Experience of Mixed Reality Virtual Display Layouts in Airplane Environments. So, augmented reality headsets have the potential to significantly enhance the user experience by overlay information on top of the real world. Um, this is even more interesting um, in passenger contexts, such as airplanes, which enable people to move beyond restrictive displays, such as laptops and mobile phones, which put people in very uncomfortable positions and limit the way people experience content while in transit. And unlike VR headsets, AR headsets actually enable people to be aware of their surroundings. Um, AR also enable people to recreate a full working workspace with only a headset and some peripheral devices for input, such as uh, the work from McGill et al. Uh, from 2020. Um, also, a recent example of this type of uh, AR for workspaces is the Infinite Workspace uh, by Facebook, which enable people to use AR to recreate their workspace using a horizontal layout. Uh, also, um, virtual displays have been seen as, uh, as effective and uh, preferred as um, physical displays um, when compared um, it in like an AR kind of uh, um, setting in recent studies about multi-display layouts. But actually differently from physical displays, users can easily rearrange the, those virtual displays adapting the displays to their present, to their preference. Uh, this is even more important for like uh, passenger contexts, as displays must take into consideration not only the physical environment, uh, but also the social context people are in, like uh, the people around them. So uh, this actually uh, poses a problem. So how actually should we lay out uh, virtual displays to best fit within the transit context? So um, we 
devise two different uh, set of uh, research questions. The first one would be, would actually familiar wide horizontal layout configurations remain preferable in an airplane context? And should virtual, and should virtual displays actually respect the depth constraints of the passenger physical environment? Uh, to answer these questions, we propose um, a user study to explore user attitudes, usability, and comfort regarding display layouts in a VR simulate airplane environment. Um, so our, we conducted a, a remote user study using Zoom um, because of the pandemic actually, and where actually we sent uh, an Oculus Quest X file APK to be used in participant headsets prior to the study. So we guided through um, them, we, we, we guided them through the, the whole experiment. Uh, and to kind of simulate the social and physical context of AR and VR, uh, we actually use a virtual environment where people could, um, where, where, where people could, uh, would have like people around them to use the avatars as proxies to real people in, the, in a plane. Uh, uh, so uh, we had three different display layouts in, in our study. For the first one was the horizontal, which is the most common one of existing physical multi-monitor experience that uh, was curved around the user. Uh, and a focus display, which consisted of one big display and two peripheral displays, maximizing the focus on one, dis one display at a time. And a vertical layout, which is, was a, a tall workspace wrap wrapping around the user constraining uh, virtual content to the seating area. Uh, we explored this layouts in two different distances. One was near, so constrained by the seat, and, where, um, and uh, on a far one um, where we the, where we push the displays further away uh, and hand render them on top of all the objects. And in this condition, we conserve the same angular size of the, the, the layout so people could uh, use the same physical effort to reach uh, like the borders of the virtual uh, workspace. Our task was a like a mocked up task. Uh, so basically people would um, watch videos that would uh, show someone planning a holiday. So the idea was them, they like videos would pop up on the main display and change to the peripheral display. So they had to change um, be between the peripheral displays to the main display. Um, we're using the controller. So to, to test our research questions, we use um, uh, the NASA TLX usability score, and we selected uh, four different sub, sub metrics. So mental and physical demand, effort, and visual discomfort. And we actually use four more um, uh, metrics about neck fatigue, co-presence of avatars. So the influence of uh, other people uh, in this case, the avatars that we use, and how likely would they uh, use those layouts in a, like a real plane? And also we conducted more um, semi-structured interviews for more qualitative feedback. Uh, so to test for statistical significance, we performed a statistical analysis on the questionnaire data. Uh, so we first uh, performed the shapiro wheel test to test for data normality. And since the uh, results did not follow a normal distribution, we used an aligned ring transformation and then performed the two factor repeated measures and ANOVA with type effect, layout, and distance uh, as factors. So, when analyzing each TLX factor uh, separately, we found statistically significant results. So, regarding effort, for example, we found significant main effects uh, for uh, between uh, different layouts where participants use it, uh, had used uh, less, um, had uh, significantly less effort to, to perform the task with vertical layouts uh, overall when comparison, when comparison to, to both horizontal displays and focus displays. Uh, we also found significant main effects for the physical dimension metric between layouts where participants felt the task to be more physically demanding with the horizontal layout in comparison, in comparison with the vertical layout. There were also many effects of serves in terms of mental demand between layouts. Uh, with 
vertical layouts demanding less uh, mental demand than focus display. Uh, a similar behavior was actually observed in the visual discomfort metric, where focus displays elicited more visual discomfort overall, uh, but with statistical significance only between focus and virtual displays. Uh, uh, so, uh, and when comparing between the three main types of layouts uh, within the diff, uh, the within the two, two distances, the 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 co the co presence, uh, we found that. A main, a significant main effect in co-presence of avatars in terms of distance. This was the only metric that uh, had a significant effect on distance, and where, where people actually uh, were more aware about avatars in the near condition. If so, because they actually in the horizontal condition, they in the near condition, they had to actually look more to the side um, to to see the to to reach the borders of the workspace. Uh, we also found main effects between layouts in this metric, uh, where horizontal uh, displays had a higher score in comparison with vertical displays. And lastly, we found significant uh, main effects for the plan usage uh, metric, uh, where participants reported to be more likely to use vertical layouts than the horizontal la display, the horizontal layouts, and the focus displays. So we, uh, additionally to that, we, cons uh, we conducted semi-structured interviews um, on, uh, and the in we recorded the, the, the interviews so we could uh, transcribe the data and we analyzed uh, this data using a three-stage open axial and uh, selective coded process. So one of the, the topics that came up from the interviews were the, the multi for multitasking and mixed displays. So actually one people that they said is that a virtual workspace uh, enable people for more in efficient multitasking so they could use uh, multiple applications at once even when in transit. Um, another thing was actually that uh, this virtual displays enable people to simulate a bigger workspace in a and even in constrained uh, physical spaces in a comfortable way. So people really like the idea of having like multiple screens uh, around around them while in in a plane, for example. Uh, another common theme that came from the, the the interviews were the were about personal space and collisions. So actually, people uh, preferred uh, thought that the horizontal displays were more comfortable, but they actually had a concern on physical collisions with other objects. So they would were actually afraid of like turning their heads and bumping to someone next to them. And also, uh, people were at also concerned about social collisions in the horizontal layout. So for example, like when they actually turn their head in the horizontal condition, they would um, uh, stare at the people next to them. Uh, and this was not very comfortable for people. Um, yeah. So in overall, we people said that the vertical displays uh, were not as ergonomically comfortable uh, than the horizontal displays because of the also because of the weight of the headset and the type of motion they needed to do to to reach the borders of the workspace. But they found it more socially comfortable because it actually feels like it's more their space in this case. Uh, also, another theme that came was that the preference of the layout depended on the task. Even though the vertical display was overall the better one, um, the preferred one. Uh, people actually liked that one also for like productivity tasks and a task um, and the um, focus one could be used for more uh, entertainment kind of tasks. So they would have like a big uh, thing at, at once. So would actually wide horizontal displays remain preferable in an airplane context? And we can actually say no because, um, because the people who actually prefer layouts that were constrained to their, their seating area because of physical and social collision that may appear awkward when one transits. And should actually virtual displays um, respect the, the constraints of the passenger physical environment? And uh, regarding that, we can't, we, we didn't actually um, had a lot of, uh, we didn't saw um, physical significance between the two conditions. So people overall preferred having uh, um, displays further away but did, 
this did not even like uh, completely um, improve their um, comfort. So they actually can do it if they want to. So uh, concluding our talk, we can say that the file layouts were preferred for awareness and comfort. Uh, the layout preference was highly influenced by social factors and the vertical uh, layout was the preferred for productivity and the, and the focus uh, layout was preferred for entertainment. So for more information, please read our paper and um, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. So um, we have uh, a, little bit time, a little bit of time for questions. There are a couple of questions that popped up during your talk uh, relatively early. It could be that your, the subsequent part of your talk answered some of those aspects, but I'm going to read them out to you anyway. So the first question comes from Ed, Edgar, Edgar Rojas Munoz, and uh, I quote, very interesting project. You mentioned that people use headsets. This implies that the survey population had experience with virtual reality or at least with immersive technologies. I would say that this could introduce a bias given that not all airplane users have experience with XR. What is your take on this? Do you think this could change the preferences you found? Yeah, and in, in this case, we actually could... Uh... I, I'm having some kind of weird feedback, but uh, I'll try to, to answer. So uh, in our case, we had actually to um, limit a bit our, um, our, our sample because we needed to conduct this, uh, um, this, this, this study online. So, but we, we did some also like um, in, within our like personal uh, circle of uh, or like uh, or participants, so we actually had both unexperienced and experienced um, users in our our, our study. Um, yeah, so I I actually and did, we even did like a statistical analysis between unexperienced and experienced users, and we didn't find anything uh, different uh, between them. So. Um, and because because like uh, our uh, concern were more like in social factors than actually the input technique, one would not really need to have a lot of experience with XR. So we kind of use the people to kind of simulate a real use. So like imagine that you have a headset on and you look to that to the, that people. So we try to keep as much uh, we we try to explain it as much as possible and. and in those experiments. Thank you, thank you. So I'm gonna read another question by Matt Gottsacker. Um, he hasn't asked the question yet, so. <clears throat> so he asks, uh, he's from um, UCF, from the University of Central Korea. Thank you for the interesting talk. Do you think the quality of results of people not feeling as socially comfortable with the horizontal display would apply to VR music on airplanes? In other words, do you think users may not feel as constrained by their small physical space because they cannot see the people around them? Well, um, this is an interesting question because, like, uh, even though even though people couldn't really see them, there was like some other papers that actually looked at this, and people are still like when you are in a public space using the VR you also need some type of feedback of people around them. So if, like, like survey uh, people uh, actually said that they would want to have some sort of notifications up about the real world. So we from the University of Glasgow, we, we had a paper about the uh, specifically social acceptability of uh, using VR in planes and uh, how to notify people up about that, those notifications. So yeah. I could probably point that in, let's say, the, the, the Discord channel for, for if you, you're interested in. Go to gather time for additional questions. There is another question by, by Mike Lee that you can see in the, in the QA. But uh, and motion sickness comes to mind, and maybe you can alleviate motion sickness for those miserable you know, center aisle seats and so on. So there, there is a lot to discuss. So I, I encourage uh, the attendees to have additional questions and uh, to join, join all the speakers and gather time. So thank you. Thank you so very much, Daniel. On to uh, paper five uh, of my papers. 
also. So in the paper title is Flash Video Embeddable AR Anchors for Live Events. Uh, the presenter is Edward Liu. Edward is a senior undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon University. He studies electrical engineering, um, and his uh, interest is in embedded computer vision as well as augmented systems. So, so um, Ed is his head of the software work. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. So, um, Everyone, my name is Edward Liu, and I am an undergraduate in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting our work on Flash that is in collaboration with John Miller, Nuno Pereira, and Anthony Rowe, who are also at Carnegie Mellon University. So our motivation for Flash comes from the desire to connect mobile AR content to live action events um, in stadiums and sporting events. So imagine the example shown here on the left where fans of a Formula One race can see braking points and vehicle stats overlaid on the track in real time. This information is now becoming available for TV audiences, but why not add the capability for fans in the stadium? Um, and the image on the right here shows a similar example of AR content that is added to an in-concert video recording. But again, why not try to add those into the mobile feed of many users that are probably already recording the show with their phones out? So in practice, this boils down to the problem of being able to quickly and accurately localize all of the mobile phones in a venue. So normally what we can do is use reference images of the background, or we can use optical markers like AR tags or April tags. But in live action events, this is hard for three main reasons. So the first reason is that environments are often highly dynamic, which make it hard to find fixed elements. Uh, the first image here shows uh, a dramatic stage change event uh, during a Super Bowl halftime show. Uh, the second problem is that these events often have highly dynamic lighting, which again, makes it hard to consistently see passive tags. And finally, these venues are often quite large. So if we were to use standard passive tags, those tags would need to be huge. So in order to make tags that work in live action environments, we have two key insights. First, um, these venues already have uh, ubiquitous and highly visible screens. So in these venues, screens are everywhere. So if you could somehow encode AR markers within those screens, we wouldn't need to add any additional infrastructure. Second, uh, we've learned from related work that encoding an ID in a blinking signal can boost range compared to standard tags. Uh, the intuition here is that you need significantly lower pixel density if you spread a code uh, by blinking it over time. Previous authors have used this insight to develop AR tags from tiny LED point sources. Uh, we build upon this approach by applying some of the intuition behind static tags, where the shape of the tag itself can help narrow down visual search space and reduce processing time. And our result is flash an active optical marker with a coding mechanism that allows it to be embedded into existing video displays. This means you can just add a video of a flash marker into uh, the video screen for a display or an LED panel and use that as an AR reference marker. As a natural byproduct, the tags work over a long range. So we've worked to spread the compute overhead across frames to make the tags faster for video processing. And since we can track the shape around the tags from frame to frame, this helps make them more resilient to camera motion and greatly improves processing speed. And since they're active tags, they are naturally detectable under widely dynamic lighting conditions. Finally, we show that a six degree of freedom camera pose can be estimated with a single flash tag, just like uh, traditional static markers. However, unlike traditional tags, Flash takes uh, the aid of an IMU on the user's phone to help resolve pose ambiguities that often arise when viewing a planar tag uh, from a far distance. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'll show a demo, but uh, this is all fast enough to run within a browser on your mobile phone without the need to install any additional software. So here's a quick example of Flash running in a browser on an iPad. We see that it works from a long range, even with lots of handshake, as well as being able to work well from pretty extreme angles. So 
Well, now let's walk through a bit on how Flash works. So our first step is that we detect quads in a scene. So unlike most marker systems, we don't have to be super tolerant about what is detected as a quad. In the above images, the blue rectangles show potential locations for Flash tags. Uh, in a passive system like April tag, the algorithm would need to iterate through every detected quad in the image and perform an expensive decoding step. But our system does something a bit different. So after we detect the quads, we do nearest neighbor tracking of quads from frame to frame. Uh, unlike other active tag systems, we track quads rather than points, uh, which allows us to drastically narrow down the search space across frames and, uh, and improve tracking and reduce processing speed or and reduce processing time. Next, at each frame, we record the intensity uh, of the quad uh, in the image and then store them across n frames. Then we normalize these vectors for each quad over the n frames. And finally, we compare these vectors against the dictionary of valid codes. And these codes are specifically designed such that they're rolling in nature, uh, which reduces latency and tend to reject false positives. In terms of performance, the first thing we need to look, uh, the first thing that we look at is detection range. So we decided to compare against April tags in this paper because they are representative of a typical passive tag system. But in general, the trends we show here would apply to any active versus passive uh, tag system. So uh, here we see that for a 15 centimeter tag, flash is basically limited by the ability to detect quads. Uh, and because of this, uh, it yields about 25% more range than standard April tags. More practically, we can detect a 70 centimeter display from 75 meters away. So over here, we made this uh, uh, flash tag out of a poster board and a monitor with some black tape around the border. And you can see on the image on the right that the tag is basically just a blurry dot, yet it could still be decoded. Because we decode intensity across frames, flash doesn't need to perform ID decoding within each tag uh, on each frame. This means it could be more lenient about accepting quads and it spreads decoding time across frames. Um, this makes Flash 10 times faster than April tags per frame, which is really great for video. It's also worth noting that you can get a pose update on every single frame. To determine the pose of the camera, we take an approach similar to other active marker or other optical markers. Um, we use projections of the corner of the tag as reference points to solve for the pose of the camera. However, due to rotational symmetry, there are four possible solutions for camera orientation. On top of that, you often end up with two possible solutions due to ambiguity from perspective, as you can see on the left. This is especially a problem at long distances and occurs with any type of passive tag or any type of planar tag. Uh, robotic systems solve this problem by tracking multiple hypotheses over time. But in this paper, we use the camera's gravity vector, which is obtained using IMU sensors accessible through the web browser. This allows us to resolve the perspective ambiguity and the rotational symmetry problem at the same time. The biggest drawback of flash is clearly that its flicker is extremely noticeable. In many venues, uh, that's masked by all of the other actions in the scene, like in the Formula One case where there were a lot of flashing lights around in the background. But it would still be great if we could make it a bit more subtle. In our case, the limit is the frame rate and processing speed available to us uh, in uh, modern web browsers, but we can easily make a faster native application that can take advantage of hardware acceleration or multi-threading to speed up processing. We could also adjust the brightness of the tags to adapt to the environment lighting to make them more subtle. This is something that many public displays already do. Finally, we think that we can decrease our detection latency and increase our code efficiency if we used balanced Kunth codes that try to keep the average number of ones and zeros in our codes consistent. So in conclusion, please go check out our paper on Flash. We show an interesting new way to easily support active tags that are quite fast such that they can be able to be run in a standard web browser. And finally, I'd like to leave off with a video of an interactive demo that you can try for yourself. So if you visit the desktop link on the slide, it will show a video with some flash tags at the end. The video includes a QR code that takes your mobile device to a web page that locally runs the decoder. 
As you can see in the video, a normal iPad running Safari can decode the text blinking in a YouTube video that's running on the MacBook. It's also worth noting that you need a pretty fast phone and your computer needs to be fast enough so that the frame rate is consistent on the YouTube video. And so that sort of means that your mileage may vary, but uh, please consider giving it a try. And if you have any questions, please come, uh, uh, please ask during the Q&A session or come to us in Gather Town. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you so much, Edward. Um, I was told that my mic doesn't work quite well and, and uh, it makes some bad noises, but Michele is telling me now that, that it's good. I was, yeah. uh, I, I rebooted my laptop, so, so I'm glad to hear that, that the mic is set, but also I missed quite a bit of your presentation. So we're waiting for, uh, we're waiting for questions in the chat. Um, so, so one question that I have is about um, one of the earlier images and, and motivating videos that you had was of a of a user having having a phone um, and looking at the real world scene, it was a racetrack, Formula One racetrack through it, and you you drew it transparently. So, um, is there is there any way um, you or are you considering actually making it transparent, basically to modify the video frame to match more what user would see if the phone were not there, or or do you think that that's important? I'm thinking that maybe if, if the user moves the phone away, then they want to, to continue the, the visualization as seamlessly as possible with what they saw before. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, so, do you, so just to be clear, the, the question is that like, uh, so, so I mean, essentially the flash tag would take um, sort of AR content overlaid across the screen um, near the, the, uh, the, the racer. So you can see live like breaking live speeds and, and updates for the cars. So your question is asking why are the the like the the AR content a bit transparent? Um, no, I missed a little I, bit of your question. I was uh, adjusting my question, my... my question has to do with uh, with uh, the continuity or the discontinuity between um, the part of the scene that's seen directly and the part of the scene that is observed through the display, whether you thought that that's, that's disturbing and that's something that you, you, you're considering addressing in the future. So once you get a um, camera update, uh, you should be able to just um, like consistently track the cars and the content will show up live or the cars itself would have flash tags on them so that the content would, um, like you, I guess you would sort of have to uh, sort of record the cars with your phone so that um, content can show up next to them, um, which is, I think is fine because they're usually, uh, if when you're in these venues, you're recording the cars anyway. So you should always be looking at the cars. Um, I think that- Thank it, you. Yeah. So um, any other questions? You, you have some, some comments uh, in, in the chat that, that you, can, you can have a look at. But if not, um, let me remind everyone one more time that um, uh, all the authors, all the speakers will be available in GatherTown and we are track B. So make your way to the Q&A track B in GatherTown and, and you'll have the opportunity to, to ask additional questions. And um, I, I think we had uh, an excellent uh, uh, lineup of, of, of papers with very diverse applications. And, and let's hope that we can see AR and VR be used more in, in our day-to-day -day lives, I think. Uh, let's let's see if we can do better than Pokemon Go, right? Like that's still the the, the super tall bar in in all graphs of, of AR usability or AR uh, popularity, AR application popularity that that we're we're, we're trying to uh, uh, to match at some point. So thank you very much, uh, Edward, and thank you all the speakers for your for your great presentations and your great work. Um, and um, please continue to enjoy. Is more and definitely do go to Gather Town for additional details from from your app uh, from your authors. So uh, you see the the message there. So I'm going to read it out for you. It says uh, from Michele, hi attendees, please join Q and A track B rooms in Gather Town to interact with the authors at the end of the session. To easily find the room, follow Michele Gattullo. So he's going to be there. So so uh, locate his avatar and he'll lead you. Um, uh, he'll teleport you directly to the appropriate uh, place. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you for attending the session and, and enjoy smart.